When he found us, say amen. amen. Still look and say, wait for me. Amen. 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 I see folk with dumb electronic devices can find it real quick. Amen. I'm still old fashioned, Deacon Griffin. I like to pick my word up. Amen. Amen. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Belim. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent it to all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You may be seated. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come at this hour just thanking you for your Holy Spirit today. God, we know if we come with something, you will meet us. Thank you, God, for the praise and worship, the reading of God's Word, all the things that we've done thus far. But now, God, what's front and center of our lives is your Word. Because it is your Word that will hold us in the good times and the bad times. So God, we ask that you would bless your word, because your word is already blessed. Bless those who need to hear. Bless those who need to be saved by your word. Have your way, Holy Ghost. Come with all thy quickening power. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Walk with me, you will, back to that text. 20. So Ahab said unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. Say Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you, ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people, somebody say the people, the people. answered him not a word. Look at your neighbor right there in the face and neighbor, neighbor. Get, off get off the fence. That's what we're going to preach today. Get off the fence. Deacons, recently I was reading an article about one of my favorite all-time basketball players by the name of Michael Jordan. And those of you who have followed Michael Jordan know that he was a committed and passionate athlete, that he was intolerant of mediocrity. I mean, when Jordan came on the court, it was to win every time. One of the most competitive persons you ever wanted to see. But not only was he competitive on the court, he was competitive off the court. Uh, there's a story shared in his book, um, if you ever get a chance to read, uh, read it's called Driven Within. And the story is told of one of his best friends by the name of uh, Fred Whitfield. Now, Fred Whitfield had been with Michael for years and years, has served as his agent, uh, served as a counselor, uh, served as a, a many things, a partner, business partner, etc. And one day, uh, the story is told, Michael went to visit him in Whitfield's home in Greensboro, North Carolina. And after they shared uh, uh, some time together, they said, let's go out to dinner. And so Michael told him it was cold and he needed a jacket. So Michael goes and the guy said, okay, man, go ahead and get, grab any jacket you want to grab. So Michael goes into Brother Whitfield's closet and Brother Whitfield waits and waits and waits and wonder why it's taking so long. Finally, Michael Jordan comes out with sneakers. He comes out with various jackets and all these things. And so, um, and one thing that was, uh, similar about all the items Michael, Jack, Michael Jordan took out 
of Brother Whitfield's closet, all of them had puma, puma on them. You know, puma sneakers. So Jordan drops it all in the middle of the guy's floor. Uh, because Puma was uh, a brand that Ralph Sampson, who was a great basketball player, who also was a friend of Brother Whitfield's. So Jordan comes in and drops it all in the middle of the floor. He goes into the brother's kitchen and gets a butcher knife. He comes and takes the butcher knife and he cuts up all the man's gear. And the man, Brother Whitfield, looking at him like he's got crazy. I guess he had a butcher knife in his hand. He wasn't going to say anything. And so then Michael, after he's satisfied, takes all the pieces out to the dumpster. He comes back into Brother Whitfield and says, listen here, call my agent with Nike and tell him tomorrow I want him to replace all of this stuff. Because Michael Jordan said, you can't ride the fence. Because Michael's brand was Nike. And he had half Puma in his closet and had half Nike in his closet. And so Michael said, if you're going to ride with me, you got to get rid of all the stuff that's not Nike. And, 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 I, and I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I want you to see in the story what Michael was saying is that either you with me or you against me. The message is get off the fence. My brothers and sisters, there's a demon that's rolling through the body of Christ. It's spreading like wildfire. Uh, this demon is causing many in the body of Christ to lose its effectiveness. This demon is causing many of the, in the body of Christ to believe that the Christian walk in life has no personal cause. The demon can be called many things, but today I want to call that demon fits. Christianity. <laughs> you know what a fence sitter is? A fence sitter is someone who's in a state of indecision. Neutrality. Can't make up their mind whether they're going to be on this side or that side. It is a, it's a non-committal person. And deacon, God does not like fence sitters. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. The children of Israel had come of a situation where they had served God, but they were surrounded by all these foreign gods. In Exodus 20, chapter 3, I'm sorry, Exodus 20, verse 3, you will find the first commandment. Y'all know it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Why did God do this? Remember, they are coming out of Egypt surrounded by Theism, which means many gods. And so God said, I'll establish you as my people, and you ought to be a monotheistic, meaning only one God. And so he wants to establish right away, Reverend Taylor, I'm going to make you my people, but you will have no other gods before me. Oh my God. Uh, and so God in, 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 um, in Exodus 20, verse 3, says, There shall no God before me. God says that I am priority. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That verse is about priority and presence. Somebody say priority. priority. Somebody say presence. Yeah. That first commandment that God gives. But you're going to understand the basis in which God gives this commandment. That oftentimes people look past verse 1 and 2 of chapter 20. Verse 1 and 2 of what is known as the preamble. And it's the introduction. And it's important because it establishes why we should follow the commandments. Can I teach before I preach? You see, the preamble establishes the fact that God said these words. Now, we are called, not called to follow absolutely man's moral standards. Because man can get off base. But God said, these are my words. And you are absolutely to follow my moral standard. Because man only looks at the outside, but I see what's in your heart. Priority. God said, we must be for And other words, brothers and sisters, there ought to be no rival to God in our hearts. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Whether it be family, friends, money, job. Position, power. God said, I'm a jealous God. God said, 
should know something. God is serious about having priority in our lives. God is gets sick of what we call fence sitting. You know how I know that, deacons? Well, if you go to Revelation chapter 3, there's a church called Laodicea. Yeah. Laodicea church had a lot going on, but the main criticism against them, they were lukewarm. He said, you either call or you're not high. And God said, I will spit you out of my mouth. God can't stand Christians who are lukewarm. Got one foot in the world and one foot in God. Uh oh, it's going to get tight. going to get tight. In, this verse, he, he, in that revelation verse, God is making a clear declaration. He is saying, there is no middle road with me. Either you're with me or you ain't. Can I preach this thing? I that. You, you, see, you see, some folk in the body of Christ are happy being in the Lord and being in sin at the same time. They believe they have the best of both worlds. How the Bible makes it clear that you can't straddle the fence. The Apostle James says, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. The true believer cannot be a friend of God when he or she has one foot in the sinful world and one foot in Christ. It's like somebody sitting on the fence. Touch your neighbor and say, get off the fence, get off the fence. Throughout the Bible, we have stories of the children of Israel. Time and time again, God sends the prophet to them to warn them about straying away from him. Time and time again, God hears their cry and they come to God and then after a while they back off and serve idols. So God sends the prophet to tell the people to get off the fence. Greek background of our text, Brother Ahab, one of the most wicked kings you've ever seen. The Bible says in 1 Kings 16, he was more wicked than everybody else. Then he had this woman named wife named Jezebel. Jezebel was something, I'll tell you. There's a Jezebel spirit in the church of God today. Well, that's another pre that's another preacher. But I'm worried. Uh, and, and Jezebel and Ahab had turned the people away from God. And the prophet comes to the king, and the king sees him and says, When you come to give me trouble, he said, I ain't causing trouble. You're causing trouble. Because you you are leading the people into an mentality. Lord have mercy. So he said, this is what I want to do. I want you to bring all the people of Israel to Mount Carmel. And at Mount Carmel, there's going to be a showdown between the 850 prophets of the false God and the one true living God. But, 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 check this out, preachers. Before the showdown, before the showdown, here comes the prophet with a question to the people. He says, how long are you all going to halt between two opinions? Ever, how long are you going to say you love God and then you love the false gods? How long are you going to waver between being serious about God and serious about the stuff of the world? Between two opinions. Lord have mercy. The Israelites were determined to serve God, but then they were determined to serve me. Tell your neighbor, try to love too was hard to do. It's hard to do. It takes a lot of energy. But Elijah challenges the people with this question. You see, from the time that God called Israel, he called Israel to shape the world around them, not to be shaped by the world around them. Israel was to influence the world for God, not having the world influence them. Mercy. When Israel came to the promised land, God said, look at here. When y'all get in that promised land, don't act like you don't know. You didn't get this stuff on your own. I did it for you. And so when you get in there, don't forget who did it for you. God warned them not to follow the false God of the world around them. Somebody better hear me today. God warned them not to, be, not to worship what their neighbors worshipped. 
despite the warnings. Someone said, despite the warnings. Israel kept vacillating. I mean, kept wavering between God and false God. Back and forth, back and forth. Israel wanted to have that cake and eat it too. They wanted God when they needed him. And after God came and blessed me, God, God, I need your help. And then God heard their cry. And as soon as God answered their cry, they had no more need for God. So Elijah says, how long are y'all going to sit on the fence? Touch that. How long? How long? <laughs> you see, here's the problem. A lot of folk have a problem with the sacred and the secular. Let me explain it. The sacred are the things of God. Now folk are sacred on Sunday. I need a question this morning. 
that the same question the prophet raised. Are you sitting on the fence this morning? Earlier I read your passage from chapter 3 of Revelation and it said hot or cold. God said really the people who are actually in a cold position are better off spiritually than the ones who look warm. Joshua had the same problem. Joshua was getting ready to die. Getting ready to transition. But he got an issue with the people of Israel. He says to them, he said, look, look at here. Let me tell you what God has done for you. God has brought you into the promised land. God has quieted your enemies. They said the wall of Jericho couldn't be knocked down. But God told Joel just to march around the wall and just shout and the wall came tumbling down. God has provided you with a land of milk and honey. God allowed you to cross over the Jordan River at flood stage. You went on dry land and he says that all this God has done for you, you still have idols. You still haven't given your allegiance to God. You still sometime. But let's not be too hard on them. Isn't that the same with you and I? Think about what God has done for us in the past and what God is doing for us in the present. Think about what God doors God has opened. Think about all the provisions God has given us. Think about all the grace and mercy he has shown us. Think about all the ways he's made out of nothing. Doesn't have to stop sitting on the fence. So look what Joshua says to the people in Joshua 24, 15. He said, some of y'all are trying to act brand new. He said, some of y'all are trying to love too. He said, some of y'all are have developed spiritual amnesia. You have forgotten what God has done for you. You have you have come this far because God did it. You have come this far because God delivered you and God made 
Amen. See, discipleship, we are being shaped into the image of Christ. And then as God is shaping us, He's shaping us inside. Discipleship is not half-hearted, but whole-hearted. You can't be a disciple and be famous. You gotta be faithful. I'm wondering today, is there anybody in here who's ready for a different level of commitment? Is there anybody here ready to move from a casual commitment to God to a serious commitment to God? Is anybody here tired of fencing Christianity? Is anybody here want to go to a new level in Christ? Does anybody in here want to see Jesus like you've never seen him before? Is there anybody in here who wants to experience the power of God? Is anybody in here who want to feel the presence of God? Is anybody here want to hear the Lord with you and talk with you? Is there anybody here who want to see God? Who want to see his power and his presence? Is there anybody here who's tired of sitting on the fence? If you're tired, shake somebody's hand. Is there neighbor?